Welcome to the Radical Truth Podcast. I am your host, Glenn Meldrum, and this podcast is brought to you by In His Presence Ministries. Visit us on the web at www.ihpministry.com. We started studying chapter 10 of Luke's Gospel in our last podcast, and we got through the first 16 verses. This was about Jesus sending out 72 disciples to heal the sick and preach the good news of the kingdom of God. For those of you who enjoy reading the King James Version, you will find that your Bible states that Jesus sent out 70 disciples. The difference between translations in this matter is of no real consequence and doesn't change the historical accuracy or integrity of the account. This story begins at Christ's final trek to Jerusalem, which is the fifth category according to Luke's structure of his historical narrative. The good doctor doesn't tell us when this category began, only that it will lead to Christ's suffering and death. We don't know if it was a month, six months or more. All we know is that it was an extended period of time. Jesus sent out 72 disciples that went ahead of him to prepare the villages for his coming, and there's no way this could have been done in a few days and probably not even in a few weeks. At the beginning of our Lord's ministry, he didn't want to quickly attract a lot of notice. This was so he could have the needed time to prepare the disciples to spread the gospel throughout the world after his ascension into heaven. As everything was moving towards Messiah's crucifixion, he pulls out all stops and let his fame spread like wildfire. He sent those disciples so that they could have some serious on-the-job training and to draw attention to his message and mission. The first 16 verses of chapter 10 are all about Jesus sending out the 72, while the next four verses are about their returning to Jesus after their time of ministry. This was excellent training for ministry, and it's very sad that this isn't how it's done today or required before people become pastors. Verse 17 gives us a glimpse of what happened when the disciples met with Jesus again. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even demons submit to us in your name. The joy the 72 had was in part from the authority Jesus gave them to cast out demons, but I think there's more to it than that. They came to know the joy that comes to those who win souls to Jesus. They were seeing lives transformed through the signs and wonders the Lord was doing through them, and these opened the hearts of the people to hear the preaching of the gospel. A very sad reality about the modern Laodicean church is that not many people know the joy of winning souls to Jesus, because not many within the church are actively seeking to win people to Christ. The 72 went at the Lord's command to preach the good news, and included with this was the command to heal the sick. The one is to go with the other. Jesus never wanted the preaching of the gospel to be separated from his performing signs and wonders through those who believe. When the 72 went out, they had to believe to see the miraculous take place. If there were any who didn't believe well, then they didn't see the Lord do much through them, while those who believed well saw the Lord do great things. Now, I don't want to diminish the reality that each of them had struggles with unbelief, because I can almost guarantee that they did, just like we do today. Not just that, as the tempter was seeking to fill them with unbelief. Imagine when each of the 36 teams of two came upon the first person that needed healing or a demon cast out. There would have been the temptation to fear, which was fear of failure, fear of man, or fear whether the Lord would use them or not. There could have been the fear that they were not good enough to be used by God, and so on. But everyone that had prevailing faith saw miracles take place, person after person, village after village, until the disciples left a trail of miracles behind them. This is what God wants to do through us as well. In the midst of it all was the preaching of the truth, so that people could be saved. Whether those they ministered walked with God or not wasn't their responsibility. Their responsibility was to go, preach the kingdom of God, and perform signs and wonders through the power of Jesus' name. Their coming back with great joy was not only on account of the miracles they saw, but that the Lord used them, and this would have been astounding to many of them, if not all. None of us deserve to be used of God, not the seventy-two or the twelve, not before Christ's death and resurrection or after the day of Pentecost. This is all the grace of God in evidence in the lives of those early saints. This is what we are in desperate need of in our time the biblical faith that gives evidence through signs and wonders and the anointed preaching of the Word of God. Jesus replied to their joy wasn't given to rob them of joy, but to keep them rooted in the truth. And we see this in verse 18 where the Lord said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. 
This isn't hyperboil or an allegorical statement, nor was this a dream or vision that Jesus had. As a timeless God, Jesus was literally there when Lucifer and the fallen angels were cast out of heaven to earth. Now earth is their temporary quarantine, so they don't corrupt all of creation. The fact that Jesus saw Satan fall like lightning happened because he is the one who cast them out. When the judgment fell, it was lightning fast. There could be no resistance, not even a place for arguments or combative words. The Lord knew the absolute truth and responded with perfect justice. We see from this just another time where Jesus declared his divinity in pre-existence. Some commentators assert that this is referring to Jesus observing the 72 casting out demons and how this was a terrible blow to the kingdom of hell. Yes, the 72 gave the demon hordes a terrible time, but this all came through Christ's inherent power as God. And it's true that Jesus knew through his divinity what the 72 were doing and that Satan was suffering a severe defeat from this event. Yet with each deliverance, Satan wasn't being cast out of heaven, nor was Jesus making an allegorical point. Jesus sharing with us a historical event that happened in the spiritual realm to which he was an eyewitness. The value of this historical account will be seen in the next two verses that speak of the infinite power and authority Jesus has as God and what he gave in measure to his disciples. Jesus was being a very good teacher and savior by making sure that these disciples understood that the power and authority they were operating through wasn't their own, but Christ's. The real potential for pride needed to be dealt with right away before it got a firm grip on their hearts and minds. A spiritual attack from Satan was underway and the disciples didn't even realize it. If Satan could tempt these men to give over to the evil of pride, then he could strip them of the power and authority Jesus had given them. The hordes of hell constantly use this tactic against God's people because they know that pride will keep powerless Christians powerless or strip the power from those who begin to operate through God's authority. The saints need to do a lot of dying to self, which includes pride, to start walking in the Spirit's supernatural power. And those who begin to operate in God's power must do a lot of dying to self to continue walking in Christ's power and authority. A vast portion of the church doesn't want to pay the price to gain and keep the anointing of God, and that's why so few saints and churches are operating in the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus has more to say on the defeat of Satan and the authority he has given the disciples, and we see this in verse 19. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. The Lord gave description to the enemy by calling Satan and the demons snakes and scorpions. Instead of snake, the King James Version translated the word as serpent, but the Greek word is more generic, and that's why snake is more accurate. The power of snakes in this verse isn't because they are poisonous, but that they are sly, cunning, and sneaking creatures. This is the case with demons. They are conniving creatures that are seeking to bring ruin to all of mankind, person by person. Scorpions illustrate the danger of sly, scheming devils that can inflict much suffering upon unsuspecting people. Out of nowhere they seem to strike, yet the whole time they have been looking for some sly way to do us some serious damage. It's interesting to see Paul's teaching about forgiving others in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. In verse 11 he proves our need to forgive others by stating, In order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware or ignorant of his schemes. These demons lie in wait looking for a moment where we are vulnerable, and forgiving others can be a very vulnerable spot. What Jesus stated in verse 19 is all about the church being on the offensive, not merely being defensive. Jesus said that he has given us authority, and what's the purpose of that authority? To take an offensive posture against the hordes of hell so that people might be delivered from the power of Satan to serve the true and living God. We are to go into enemy territory to take what the enemy has stolen from God. Each and every person rightly belongs to God. He is their creator and redeemer. Satan and the host of demons are usurpers, villains that are nothing more than lying thieves that steal through deception what is rightly God's. Jesus painting a picture of his saints overcoming slithering snakes and crawling scorpions by trampling them underfoot. Our enemies are so low that this fight is merely to step upon their heads. For Middle Eastern culture, this is a very graphic picture. The enemy is so vile, so degraded, that they belong under our feet as creatures of contempt, and this is a very debasing picture for enemies of our soul. 
Isaiah 14 is believed to be by many a revelation about the rebellion of Lucifer, who was once an exalted angel. The first sin Lucifer committed was to believe a lie, and this is why Jesus called him the father of lies. In Isaiah 14, verses 13 and 14, Lucifer said in his heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly, on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. He believed the lie that he was worthy of worship, and this produced the second sin, which was pride. As a created being, Satan thought that he was greater than the uncreated creator, and he raised a coup d'etat against God. His judgment fell quickly, and he was hurled down to earth as fast as lightning flashes in the sky. We don't naturally have the power to fight against the supernatural power of demons, even though their power is extremely limited. The Lord will not allow the demons to destroy mankind, so boundaries have been set that they cannot cross. God offers us His omnipotent power to deal with these demons, and through Christ we can be more than conquerors. To be a conqueror, we must have a holy aggression to fight against our spiritual foes who are stronger than we are, but are helpless against Christ. When Jesus is working mightily through us by the power of the Holy Spirit, there is no demon or demons that can stand against us. Jesus clearly said that He has given us His power to overcome all the power of the enemy. This tells us that demons have supernatural power, and this power is greater than that which we have of our natural selves. But Christ is the means by which we can be victors over our spiritual enemies. The challenging part in this verse is the point where Jesus said, Nothing will harm you. I don't want to spiritualize this point, because if we do, then we are forced to do the same with the first part of this verse, which wouldn't be right. Jesus gives us real power over the enemy, so there must be real power to protect us from the enemy. We are at war, a real war for our souls and the souls of men, women, and children. Just as we fight against spiritual foes, so they fight against us. Fighting against our enemy is spiritual, yet it reaches into the material world. Take demon possession as an example. Some people are literally possessed by a demon, or maybe demons. Yet the spiritual possession affects their physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual life. The battle isn't against the physical and mental problems that they are having due to their demon possession, but the spiritual enemy that's tormenting their soul and mind. Jesus is speaking of the spiritual attacks that will come against those who are taking an offensive against the hordes of hell by casting them out of people, healing the sick, and preaching the good news. Those who fight for Jesus against the spiritual enemies of God will be protected in the fight. It doesn't mean that the battle won't get fierce and that we won't get weary of the fight or be wounded in the battle. But in the end, we win. We are absolute victors through Christ. When we live in the Spirit through loving obedience to Christ, then we will fight the battles He is sending us out to fight, and we will in the end be triumphant, whether by life or by death. The devil can't win against those who love Jesus with all of their heart, mind, soul, and strength, and prove that love through a life of loving obedience to God's will and purpose. These are awesome truths that, when understood and lived out, will produce a living army of saints that hell can't stand against. This is what we need today. Jesus wanted to put this in perspective a little more and stated in verse 20, However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. The Lord wasn't wanting to diminish the joy the 72 disciples had when they returned from their short-term missions trip. He was wanting to get them rooted in the truth so that they could be stable in the faith and do exploits for the glory of God in the years to come. Though it's not wrong to rejoice in giving some demons a good beating in Jesus' name, what we really need is to rejoice over this wonderful gift of salvation. It wouldn't be long before Jesus would finish the work of atonement that the Father sent him to accomplish, and then the disciples would see the costliness of salvation in a whole new light. When we look at the glorious Jesus and His substitutionary work on the cross, casting out devils is nothing in comparison. Jesus performed the greatest work, and that's who and what should capture our attention. It's infinitely greater to focus upon the beautiful Savior than to boast over casting out some really ugly devils. Yet here's another sly, cunning attack from the evil one, who would even take the victory we have over Him and tempt us to focus upon the power rather than the Savior. We are so easily distracted from seeing Jesus. 
Though we may get a glimpse of His infinite greatness, we are so prone to forget what we have seen, known, and even experienced. We have wandering hearts, and demons know this fact about us and use it against us. Whenever we take our eyes off of Jesus, we are sure to begin sinking into unbelief and self-absorption. We can be like Peter who sank in the water through his unbelief, and this happened when he took his eyes off the Savior when the stormy sea captured his attention. Jesus told us to rejoice that your names are written in heaven, and we should do this on a constant basis. What does it mean that our names are written in heaven? The expression written in heaven is equivalent to our names being written in the book of life. The book of life is a New Testament thought that's pressed home in the book of Revelation where it's mentioned six times. One reference to the book of life tells us that it belongs to the Lamb, who is Jesus. This is found in Revelation 13.8. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the book of life belonging to the Lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. Paul made mention of this book in Philippians chapter 4, verse 3. Yes, and I ask you, loyal yoke fellows, help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. This form of speech may have been taken from the ancient Jewish custom of writing the names of all citizens in a public register. This way the inheritance that were given to the twelve tribes through Joshua could be preserved and passed on to each subsequent generation. Keeping track of lineage was very important for all the tribes, but especially for the tribe of Levi and the family of Aaron. The Levites were the caretakers of the tabernacle and later of the temple, while from the Levites came the family of Aaron, who were solely given the right to be priests. In the books of Nehemiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, there are references to keeping the names of the people of Israel in a genealogical record or book of life. In the New Testament, we find that the Old Testament priesthood through Aaron was done away with, and the priesthood of all believers took its place. As priests of God, our names are recorded in what's called the Book of Life, and whenever people enter the kingdom of God through repentance and salvation, they are added to that sacred book. There are a lot of people that think they know everything about the Book of Life and how the names are written in it, but our actual understanding about these things may be far less than what we want to admit. Here is some of what we know for sure. A person's name is listed in the Book of Life when they enter into salvation. Some people believe that the names of the saved are written in the book before the creation of the world because they are predestined. I believe that people's names are written in the book of life when they are truly saved, and here's why. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 5, Jesus said, He who overcomes will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and his angels. In this particular verse, Jesus is talking about eternity because he is referring to those who have overcome and are now in heaven. We are only eternally secure when we get to heaven. This verse also teaches that in this life we aren't eternally secure, since there is a real possibility that our names could be blotted out of the book of life if we backslide, and this can only happen in this life. Moses told the Lord in Exodus chapter 32, verse 32, But now, please forgive their sin, but if not, then blot me out of the book you have written. Moses was willing to go to hell so that others may be spared divine wrath. This is a phenomenal expression of compassion. For people to have their names blotted out of the book of life, they have to be actively living in sin, which is evidence that they have not taken the path of repentance. The Lord wouldn't answer Moses' prayer because it was contrary to God's plan of salvation, but his intercession was a powerful example of selfless love. There's a multitude of verses that teach the truth that people can backslide, which is to forfeit their salvation. When people backslide, their name is blotted out of the book of life, and this clearly means that salvation is taken from them. To have people's name blotted out of the book of life means that they had to first be written into the book of life. And to have their name blotted out of that holy book is as if they had never been born again, for all their righteousness is forgotten. Psalm 69 verse 28 states, May they be blotted out of the book of life and not be listed with the righteous. This is another verse which gives us a feel that the blotting out of the name happens according to earthly time and wasn't something predestined before creation. This would mean that the names were added when people are truly saved and blotted out when they backslide. The final mention of the book of life is seen in Revelation chapter 20, verse 12. And I saw the dead 
great and small, standing before the throne, and books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. This takes place at the great white throne judgment, which is the final judgment wicked men and angels will experience before being cast into the lake of fire. And this is seen in verse 15. The other books mentioned in this verse that I just quoted are records of the life people lived. They will be judged by absolute truth. We best make sure that the life we live we will not be ashamed of before all of heaven. For one day the lives of the wicked will be exposed, and then it's too late for them to repent and change. We should make it our greatest goal to have our names written in the book of life, and then live such a life that it will never be blotted out. The account we've been studying of Jesus sending out 72 disciples continues through verses 21 through 24. In verse 21 we read, At that time Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned, and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. Jesus was full of joy through the Holy Spirit, not from mere external circumstances. Yet he's rejoicing over the spiritual growth of the disciples and how they were used by the Holy Spirit to lead people into the kingdom of God. Jesus praising the Father for who he is and what he has done, and this isn't contrary to the unity within the Trinity. The Lord was modeling for the disciples a grateful heart that they needed to develop themselves. And Jesus speaks of the divine prerogative where the Father does what's in keeping with his good pleasure. In this verse, what's the Father's good pleasure? Well, there are two parts to it. First, the Lord has hidden these things, which are the truths of the kingdom of God, from those who are wise in their own eyes and have educated themselves out of salvation. Paul declared in Romans chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images to be made like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. In other words, in their supposed enlightenment and wisdom, they rejected the one true God to worship idols of creation, mankind, demons, false religions, or philosophical beliefs. These were only predestined to damnation because God has decreed that all those who reject His salvation will receive the judgment of eternal separation from Him. God didn't create them to go to hell. They rejected God's salvation, which resulted in the truth being kept from them. The second expression of God's good pleasure is that the truths of the kingdom of God were revealed to those who are like little children that simply believe the promises. Jesus sent out the twelve and then the seventy-two. Because they chose to believe like little trusting children, they saw the Holy Spirit perform miracles through them. This didn't happen because they were great or special, but because they operated through childlike faith, and this brought joy to Jesus. The next point is found in verse 22. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows who the Son is except the Father, and no one knows who the Father is except the Son, and those whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. The way this is worded makes me think that Jesus isn't praying anymore, but is making a declaration for the disciples to hear and understand. There are four points Jesus makes in this verse. The first point is that all things have been committed to me by my Father. This doesn't mean Jesus isn't divine or that he became a small god equal to Satan as the lies of Mormonism assert. The man Christ Jesus receives from the Father as the eternal Son, and from this indivisible union within the Godhead, Jesus becomes the Lord and sovereign dispenser of all things. This thought is repeated in John chapter 3, verse 35, where the Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. I think that is interesting that Jesus didn't say that these truths and power were revealed to him, since he already knew them as God. They were delivered to him as God incarnate, where the whole administration of the kingdom of grace was given to him. Such right and power belongs only to God, and as such, it proves the divinity of Christ, who has infinite power. These divine attributes or privileges are seen in other portions of Scripture. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, Jesus said after his resurrection, All power is given unto me. In Christ's high priestly prayer, he declared in John chapter 17, verse 2, For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. We see here the unity within the Trinity and how the three are indivisibly one God. 
Then in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all men. There is only one mediator, and he is God, and only he can give salvation. Since Jesus is our mediator and Savior, he therefore must be God. According to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3, Jesus has the divine power to give life and godliness, and in Revelation chapter 1, verse 18, he holds the keys of hell and death. All these are expressions of Christ's divinity. The second point of verse 22 is that no one knows who the Son is except the Father. Here is just another statement of Christ's divinity, where he is an infinite mystery that only the Father fully knows. The disciples really didn't know who he was. Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension opened their eyes much more, but only the Father fully knows the Son, and this will be true throughout eternity. The Father is also an infinite mystery, and this brings us to the Lord's third point, that no one knows the Father except the Son. Once again, here is another declaration of Christ's divinity. Only God fully knows Himself, and for Jesus to say that He alone knows the Father is to say that He is God. The fourth point is that no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. As our mediator, Jesus has the right and power as God to reveal the person of the Father to anyone He wants. He has told us in so many ways that it's not His will that any perish, but that all come to eternal life. We know that it's His will for everyone to know Him and through Him to know the Father. Yet Jesus will only reveal the Father to those who want the salvation He has to offer and will receive His salvation on His terms and conditions, not ours. In verse 23 we are told, Then He turned to His disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. I thoroughly believe that. How often I have longed in my heart to have been one of those disciples that touched Jesus and was touched by Him, that looked in those eyes and to see the miracles and hear the words that flowed from those holy lips. Those eyewitnesses saw what we will never see in the way that they did. They were truly blessed beyond what we can fathom. He went on to say in verse 24, For I tell you that many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see but did not see it and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Those prophets were aching to see what they had prophesied about. How much they understood what they were prophesying, we have no way of knowing. Yet some of those prophecies were so spectacular that they must have had a burning desire to see their fulfillment with their own eyes. In this life we will never see Jesus like those eyewitnesses did, but we can see Jesus through the eyes of faith and be touched by Him through the moving of the Holy Spirit. What we are given is no less real than what they had. It's just that we must draw near to God through faith, love, and devotion. Then He will draw near to us. He has promised it. Thank you for listening to The Radical Truth with your host, Glenn Meldrum. We at In His Presence Ministries pray that this weekly podcast will be a blessing to you. Please tell others about it and subscribe yourself to this free podcast. Don't forget to visit our website at www.ihp. M-I-N-I-S-T-R-Y dot com. See you again next time, and may God richly bless you as you seek Him in spirit and in truth. And thirst no more, so come wash in the river, come drink your fill, let healing waters bear away your gift. Oh, sure. come wash in the rain.